from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Mark Walker. Um, my stage name is Professor Horn, and I've been performing Punch and Judy now for about 25 years. For uh, those who aren't really familiar with what Punch and Judy shows are, would you mind giving us a little overview? Yeah, it's a, it's a very funny puppet show, and I think it's one of the things that attracts me to it. It's, um, they, they say that authentic Punch and Judy shows have several elements to it, one of which is that it would have uh, use of a slapstick in the show. It would also, the performer would also use a swazzle, that's S-W-A-Z-Z-L-E, and it's a little device, it's uh, made of metal and tape, and you balance it on your tongue, and it's, it's almost like a reed instrument, so when you have to, it has to be wet, and as you speak, the words come through there, and it's, that's how Mr. Punch talks. But they say if it doesn't have that, technically it's not considered a Punch and Judy show. Uh, there are some basic characters to the show. Of course, there's Punch, Judy, the baby, uh, the police officer. And there are other characters, such as Joey the Clown, uh, a crocodile, and sausages, and so forth. But no two Punch and Judy shows are, are alike. Um, and there are some similarities in that uh, when Punch comes up and meets Judy, they, have, they bring out the baby. There's some sort of interaction between them. Something usually happens to the baby. And then there's a call for the police officer. And then from there, it just goes in a million and one different directions. It's left up to the, uh, to the performer to take it from there. And not all shows actually have a crocodile in it. It's, uh, it can. Most shows do. But... Uh, I've seen some shows end with the devil. So it's, a, again, a lot of variety in it. And uh, that's what makes it kind of fun, too. You know, so. And Punch and Judy shows, the roots go back many centuries. Yes. Um, well, it was first seen in England on well, May 9th, 1662. Um, there was a man named Samuel Pepys. He was a journalist. He kept a diary. And he noted that there was this very funny puppet show. And at the time, it was actually uh, marionettes. And it, um, it, uh, it just took a long time, hundreds of years, for the show to evolve. And, of course, there was no uh, Judy in the show. She came about later, as, as did some of the other characters, the devil and so forth. But the devil and Judy, her name was Joan, were the earlier puppets in the, in the program. And as time went on, again, it took hundreds of years to evolve from from marionettes to glove puppets and for these characters to be introduced into the show. And, and like, even like the, um, there was a, like they have the police officer, but back then, if you ever saw the movie uh, Oliver, there's a character in there, it's known as the Beetle. And he was sort of like, uh, I guess it would be their version of a police officer back then. So they would, they would introduce this Beetle character and uh, they would call for the Beatle. He would come up, and again, their interactions. But as that character became out of fashion, then they put the police officer in. So the show was always moving and evolving. And uh, there's always novelty scenes in the show, too. I was telling somebody where it was, uh, I've seen some of the shows, they have a baby Trump puppet. And he has a long red tie, and his hair is up, you know, going to the side. and. I've seen them where they would introduce characters. They would, the devil would be in the show, and they would rip the devil's mask off, and he was Darth Vader. So they, you could do with the show whatever you want to do, and that's part of the fun with it, I think. You know, but uh, in England, uh, before we get to Punch mm -hmm. and Judy here in the U.S., um, what were, what were the main functions of the tradition? Where would you come across it? Uh, how has that changed over time? Well, initially, the, sh the show was seen on the streets. I mean, that, that was it. Uh, they appeared at fairs and so forth. And, uh, uh, and sometimes they weren't necessarily the main attraction either. They were used to, to bring people into the fair. That's how it, how it began. But, but most of the shows, the earlier shows, they were actually intended for adults. 
And, uh, and if you look at some of the uh, prints and engravings, you will see most of the people, not to say their children are not there, and not to say that they weren't laughing, but the performer would often play to the adults because they were the ones that had money. And uh, the performer had another person. It, usually it was a two-person uh, thing when they became glove puppets. Sometimes it was a family member. If the performer was married, his wife would be there, or the son or whatever. But if it was, uh, he was working by himself, there was always another person. It could be a friend or somebody could pick up, and it was called the bottler, B-O-T-T-L-E-R. I think that's how you spell it, bottler. And uh, that performer, I mean, he, was, he assisted the entertainer. His job was to help draw a crowd, and sometimes he would uh, bang on a drum and play some panpipes. But actually, during the show, his job was to take a bottle and go throughout the audience and take up a collection. That's basically what he did, you know. So, uh, and then again, it just evolved. And then, um, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the talks, but, you know, the, it, his image became to soften as we moved into the Victorian times. And that's when uh, they cleaned up the shows. A lot of the times the shows were, um, the, they didn't have red and white striped uh, puppet theaters, or they're called fit-ups, F-I-T-U-P-S, fit-ups. And a lot of times they use what was called ticking, which was a, a material to cover mattresses. And a lot of times it would be like re uh, blue and white check material. And that was what, you know, before they came with the red and white, you know, and, uh, but um, am I rambling here? I don't know. Not if at I all, no. This is so fascinating. <laughs> well, Tell us about the roots of the tradition in the U.S. or when it migrated over the Atlantic. So yeah, it was, uh, I think Punch was here about 1742. It was seen in Annapolis, I'm mean, sorry, it was seen in um, Philadelphia. And I think there was an advertisement for it. They called it Punch and Joan. And uh, they advertised that the figures were about uh, two or three feet high which would lead you to believe they were marionettes. And it was. It was called Punch and Jones. You could see it had not evolved in a, a true Punch and Judy as of yet. And then in some of the work that I did, um, I said there was a book, Marilyn as a Palatinate. They mentioned uh, uh, Punch and Judy in Annapolis. That was before the American Revolutionary War. And then I found a colonial newspaper. The name escapes me. But I know that Punch was actually in Fells Point, Maryland, but that was that was also done as a marionette show, and that was, a, was like somewhere in like 1750, 1760. So it was here very early, and they they said that um, George Washington in his records uh, or journal they had a uh, that he bought a ticket to see a Punch and Judy show. So it does go back, and and it was seen throughout. And there was a performer, Albert Walker. He actually did the show during the uh, Civil War. I have one of his, uh, I don't have it on display, but I have one of his broadsides. But he did the show in the Civil War. Interesting thing, his puppets, <laughs> his puppets, <laughs> they only had one arm <coughs> on each side. I guess it, they called it economies of scale. The audience only saw one side, <laughs> so he had one, one arm facing this. <laughs> oh, I was stupid, but that's what he did. But, uh, but the, the shows played all around. They, they were very big in circuses and circus sideshows. That's where they really picked up. And a lot of times with the circus sideshows, they, they called a 10 in one show where you would go in and pay money and, and you would see these 10 acts for whatever it was, a dime. And they would have a magician, a fire eater. But one of the performers was always a, a Punch and Judy man. And, and many of the guys were not. Um, well, they were full-time entertainers, but not necessarily. They did other things other than Punch and Judy. And uh, if you were to study uh, magic history and Punch and Judy, you see there is a, a correlation between the, uh, most of the Punch and Judy men, not all, but many, have been magicians. I can't explain that. You know, it's just one of the allied arts. I guess that's the best way to explain it. And, uh, and you started out as a magician as well, correct. and you still are. Uh, right, that is correct. And um, 
Over in England, too, what they have, and you didn't see it too much here, but a lot of the Punch and Judy men are magicians and also ventriloquists. And, um, and there was uh, two performers, one George Horn, he was a magician and a ventriloquist. He actually worked with two, he actually had uh, two figures. I actually had the one figure he, he sold me, and I, I, I kind of regret selling it, but it was made by Frank Marshall, which is a very famous uh, Chicago uh, carver. And I sold it, and it was bought, I sold it for like $2,000. I already paid 300 for it. But it was sold to a collector. And one time I was watching a movie called Rock the Cradle, and it starred Bill Murray, and there was Oscar in that movie. Bill Murray was used in Oscar. I must have fell out of my seat when, there's Oscar, and I remember I had pictures of him in my house, you know what I mean? But I just thought that that was so funny. But, uh, but that, again, the idea of a magician, ventriloquist, Punch of Judy, man, not too much here, but over in England you still see that. They call it the triple threat, where you could perform all three of those skills. You know, so. Well, let's take it to Baltimore. Okay. <laughs> to the particular Punch and Judy uh, show tradition that you uh, are continuing. It has a long legacy in Baltimore, the Horns. Right. Uh, excuse me, Horns, Punch and Judy show. Uh, 1897? Right. There was a, name, a man named James Edward Ross, and uh, he performed a show at a place called Pat Harris's Dime Museum. And he was there for a number of years. But his, he, there was a, a, an amusement park, it no longer exists, it was called Riverview. And he was there uh, every Sunday performing. Of course, it'd be during summertime. Okay? And uh, he was there for many years. But he also performed, he actually performed at a lot of the um, embassies in Washington, D.C. Performed at a lot of them. And, uh, and he performed at uh, Young's Million Dollar Pier in Atlantic City. He was there. And they said that when he performed on this pier, they actually had, during the show, they also had seals, a seal act, and they would applaud during the show. I thought that, that was so funny. Seals applauding during his Bunch of Judy show. But, um, yeah, but he was there for many years, and uh, uh, like I said, uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt saw his show and absolutely loved it. But um, there was a, a young gentleman, George Horn, and he saw Rosella, and he went to Riverview all the time to see him and talk to him, and he learned to show from him. He learned the basics from him is what happened. And, and Rosella actually taught one or two other performers how to do the show. But what happens is as you learn the show, it's, it's almost like you also, it's like a soup starter. You get it, here's the basic thing, and you take it, and then you work with it from there. And it's just, or like getting a recipe, you get a recipe and say, oh, it's this, and say, ah, but you know what, it would taste better if I just added a little bit of sage, or I added this in there, for Baltimore, or Old Bay, you know, <laughs> you put a Old Bay in there. But it's, uh, and that's how it works, and I think that's the way it's supposed to be meant to be. You know, you, you start with a, a basic thing, add to it, and then, and then make it a better, by the time you're done with it. Now for me, what I did is I, um, because I was really in the magic and magic history, and I had written a couple of magic history books, so as I was getting into punch, I decided, I, was, I, I saw what happened in the magic collecting world, where in the, see, my mom died in 87, Somewhere around 87, 89, the magic collecting world went crazy. Posters that you could buy for three, four hundred dollars were now selling for three or four thousand. It just went crazy. And um, I have some of those now, but, but uh, I had a, uh, I saw what happened in the magic world and I thought, you know what? I don't hear a lot of talk about Punch and Judy. And this was actually pre um, uh, internet days, right, because I think it came a little bit later. And uh, so I just started to go out and collect whatever I could on Punch and Judy and books. And as I read this stuff, I read through the scripts and say, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe I could take this, oh, that's a good joke. Maybe I would take that. And the one joke I have in my show about that with the devil, I said, uh, 
well, if you're the devil, let me shake your hand. And you know, why is that? Because I'm married to your sister. Well, that was an old joke that was given to me by, uh, who's the guy's name? Well, it escapes me right now. But he was a famous, um, it'll come to me, yeah, the performer. But he was from New York. And, um, and his son told me about that joke. So I thought, what a great joke. I haven't heard that. So I added that to the show. And then, and then some of it's also me, too. You know, I would hear things or th funny things would happen, and I would add it into the show. But, but I did keep some stuff that was from Rosella. The whole bit about the devil, you better not tell, and, all, and the monkey and all that, that came from the Rosella George Horn show that I, that I kept in there. And some of the features. But some of the things, like I said, I, I added it. I saw some things done in England, and I thought, oh, that's pretty funny. And I didn't copy it per se. I added you know, my own bits to it. And, uh, but by doing a lot of research, too, I was able to, uh, you know, there was another performer who, who used that joke about, um, it's, his name's Punch Junior, 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 Junior. Get it? It's part of the punchline, which I thought was very funny. And apparently that was used in a show and the performer was deceased and I had done research on a performer and I went, what the heck, that's a great line, I'm going to use that. And I don't think I'm the only one that does that. I think other performers, they, they pick up a line here, a joke, a gag or whatever and you put it in a show and if it sticks and it gets a good laugh, you know, you leave it in. And sometimes it's often been said you, you have to give a joke a while to, um, uh, you shouldn't dis disregard a joke just because the first audience doesn't laugh at it. And sometimes you just also have to get the timing of it down too. You know, it's just like you, you, you say this, you wait two or three seconds, and then you say this. And by doing that, you know, you, you get it. But again, you got to work it out. One, sometimes you may get a bad audience too. So you, you never give up on a joke just right away. Anyway, but anyway, that's... Who bad adds to it? Well, but going back to George Horn, one of my favorite aspects of the history of Horn's Punch and Judy show is um, how you first came across him mm -hmm. uh, and in the 1960s. Right, right. I East was, Baltimore. Right. So what happened, it was, it was the summer of 63. And um, I went to, uh, I lived around Patterson Park in East Baltimore. <clears throat> And uh, I went to a Catholic school, and we had the, the nuns. <laughs> but this one year, I happened to have a lay teacher, regular. And she was a very nice lady. And she said, uh, toward the end of the school year, we're going to have a summer picnic. And we're going to, you know, I'm going to invite everybody to this. And I kept thinking, yeah, right, I'll never. She's never going to do that. But then one time, uh, during the summer, some of the, because I didn't live that far from school with some of the neighborhood kids. Hey, don't forget, we're having this party. So I went over, and it was uh, on a Saturday, and I still remember it. We had hot dogs and sodas, and we played dodgeball. <clears throat> and then we walked over. It, it was around Baltimore uh, Street and uh, Lakewood Avenue. <clears throat> and there was George Horn, and he had his uh, Punch and Judy cabinet or fit up there. And he did the show. And I just remember, I can't remember, I actually can, cannot remember too much about the show. But I do remember his puppet theater. I thought, oh, that's really neat. That's neat. Uh, but he did something. I sometimes do it, and uh, he's the only one I ever saw do it. He would bring out the crocodile puppet at the very end of the show. And he said, and this is why I never forgot it. He said, if you left, let the crocodile give you a very gentle bite on the fingers, you'll have good luck for a whole year. And I thought, oh, that's what I want. You know, I want good luck for the rest of the year. So I did that. And I still do that sometimes. If it's a smaller crowd, manageable, or if something happens and I have to stretch for some particular reason, you know, somebody's, you know, Santa Claus isn't there yet. Can you hold off and do something for another, you know, 15, 20 minutes? I'll do that, you know. So that's a great little thing. But... Um, all right, so what was I saying there? Well, you first met him or oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. came across right, his right, show. Right. So what happened was I, uh, I remembered his name, and I think I discovered the Yellow Page. Of course, they don't, they're going out of style now. The Yellow Page phone directories. And I saw his name. It was listed under magicians. And I said to him, I called him up, 
And I said, do you have any puppets for sale? And he said, oh, I might have a couple. And I said, well, I'd like to come over and visit you. So I talked to my parents, and they kind of like humored me along. And you know, I just kind of lost interest. But um, there was a book out uh, that got out of the library. It was uh, Punch and Judy by Ed Emberley, I think it was his name. It was a children's book. It's these wonderful illustrations of Punch and Judy. Uh, it's, he, he also, I think he was the illustrator. And I checked that book out in a library, I, I know, 30 times. And it would go back in and I would get it out again. And go back. And I used to, as a kid, I used to dream about doing this show. But, and I, but I was also getting magic books out. You know, so as a kid, you got like a thousand things going on at the same time. And um, so what happened was, <clears throat> I didn't think too much more about Punch and Judy till it was about 1985, and uh, I was I was at the house, and my mother said something to me. She said, um, uh, "Mark, there's something coming up on television about puppets," and I had no idea what it was. And I took a VCR tape, what do you call them now? I don't know what they call it, but I, but I shoved it into the recorder, <coughs> and I hit a record. And it came up, <clears throat> and there was a, a three-minute segment on the uh, weekend Saturday news. <clears throat> and it was all about Punch and Judy. It was from England. I actually still have that. I, I kept that. And it was uh, John Stiles, who is probably one of the world's most famous Punch and Judy men. He was, uh, a couple years ago, he was awarded the MBE, member of the British Empire, by the Queen for his work with Punch and Judy. Uh, if you, there's a couple movies out, uh, 102 Dalmatians, he worked for Disney, and uh, what was it? Polar Express, the scene was actually cut, but if you look in there, there is a scene. He actually, uh, Tom Hanks flew him to California. He was there for like a week uh, doing that. And he also did it with Roman Polanski's um, Oliver Twist is a little scene of Punch and Judy. So he's a well-known Punch and Judy man. But when I saw this, uh, this clip, a light bulb went off on my head. And uh, I said, George Horn. So had it not been for seeing this with John, I would have never, probably would have never performed Punch and Judy at all. But it took two things. It took George Horn and it took this film clip about John Stiles. The two of them had to come in and hit me at the right time. And, uh, and that's what did it. And my uh, niece had a birthday coming up. And I was not married at the time. And uh, I always did something fun for their birthdays. So I called George Horn up and told him. I said, look, I saw your show when I was a kid. And blah, blah, blah. So uh, I hired him. And the kids were in hysterics watching this show. And I said, what a fantastic thing. But I, I looked at it. I mean, his stage didn't look anywhere near as good as this one. But it was, um, it was just such a fun act. And I thought, you know, that's what I should be doing. I really should. So um, his wife died uh, probably a couple months later. And I called him up. And I, I would come over to his house about once a month. And I would take him out to dinner. And uh, I would just go over to his house. I didn't want anything. I just just hang in there with him. I didn't. didn't I asked him about Punch and Judy, and, and he also knew a lot about the history of magic in Baltimore. He had been around, what was it, since 1902? I think he'd been, he'd been around for everything. I mean, he knew Howard Thurston. I mean, Howard Thurston came to his house once, and he's a famous magician. So uh, I, 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 that's what happened. I mean, he'd come over there, and then once, I said to him once, I said, look, never stop performing. I think you, you have a wonderful act. You should always do it. But the day you decide that you want to retire, I'd be interested in taking over. And then one day he called me up out of the blue and said, Mark, he goes, I think I'm about ready to retire. So I think I bought the show for about $300. I said, well, you know, what do you want? He said, $300. But I actually gave him an extra $100. I just, and then I worked with him. And then he started, he started to teach me about the swazzle. And then the show, and we went over the script, and it was a lot of that. So I basically did his show verbatim 
for a while because it's like, I mean, that was my soup starter. I didn't know what to do. You know? And the weird part about doing the show first, it took me about six months to memorize the script. But then you had to get the timing of it down in front of a live audience. And that's where it took probably another year or so for that to connect. Because otherwise, you're just doing this stuff, and you know people are, or they might be laughing, or you got to figure out how to get a laugh out of this. And it's again, it's getting that timing down, and you can only do that in front of a live audience. You can practice all you want, but unless you're actually there working in front of a live audience, you cannot get that. So uh, we, it, it took a, a, a year, a little bit better than a year. But then even there, from there, it was always learning, learning something else, trying something else, and uh, you know, that's how it went. And that's a core aspect of the tradition, that it's passed down, and usually there are apprentices and obviously Co masters, yeah. like George Horn was to you. Right, that is correct. Uh, and it's really interesting. What, you, know, you, you feel that it took a year to really feel that um, you were mastering or you had a good handle uh, well, on Well, I would just say uh, I was always a slow learner. <laughs> uh, probably took me a little bit longer. But, um, but I was having fun, too, and, and learning it. And, uh, but at the same time as I was doing it, I was envisioning doing something more than that. And because uh, I had some puppets, and his stage was beat up, kind of beat up. So it was, then it was a case of, I, I still have his stage and his puppets, but I wanted to rebuild that and then take it up a few notches. And then I, I, uh, I went over to England I think uh, the year after my son was born, so that would have been 96, and I went over and had a whole new set of puppets. Uh, uh, not these, but some, some other puppets. And uh, I had them made, and I came back, and then, then I started to really improve and get with it and do stuff. And, uh, and again, you're never done. You're never done. You aren't. You know? Well, that's what fascinates me, this idea that, you know, what you learn, or what are the skills, for instance, the puppet making, um, and the timing sounds like a core mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. of what you need to practice, and, right, right. and again, uh, receive from your master. But, um, yeah, w I, let's talk about the puppets. Sure. So who made yours, and what does it entail, and right. what makes a good puppet? <laughs> well, I have several sets. Uh, I get, all my sets are made in England. And I feel that they make the best puppets because they're, they're not, you could be a good carver, you could be an excellent carver, but still not make a good puppet because it's, um, I feel that the best uh, puppets come from people that are actually performing the show. They understand all the nuances with it, you know. Like, it's, it's good to have a puppet that's well balanced. Some of the heads, you can't see it, but they'll drill holes in there and use filler material to make the head lighter. And you, a person, a, a regular carver, would not know that, you know. And uh, when I had the new set of puppets made, I didn't, my older sets were made with glossy paint. And I just thought, I'd seen that, like, sometimes under light, it's a, that little bit of glare, so I wanted semi-gloss paint on there. But again, these are these little things you pick up. And, and then I also wanted all my puppets lined. So it wasn't just one piece of fabric. It was two s sets in there. And these little tricks of the trade, you don't know, but you finish your puppet show, you turn the puppet inside out. And that's two reasons why. One is to dry the puppet out in case you sweat or whatever it is, but it's also to protect the puppet in, in transport. So it's covered by cloth. Otherwise, the heads are hitting one another. So it's these little things you don't think about you know, too much. And, uh, but I had my one set that I'm using now. It was made by uh, a wonderful uh, carver named Jeff Felix. And uh, uh, where does he live? Wait. Oh, he lives around Wembley, yeah, somewhere in England. And um, yeah, he's, he actually he's worked for Henson and Disney. And uh, for Henson, I think he did, the, what was it, a couple Muppet movies. Uh, Muppets Treasure Island, and I forget what other one he did for them. But uh, yeah, but he, he, 
He's a wonderful carver. Unfortunately, he had a, a stroke about a year ago, so I, I'm not sure. Um, it's like we used to ch exchange emails. He can't even use email now, so uh, I haven't talked to him in a, in a while, and I kind of miss talking to him, you know, but it's, uh, I c try to communicate with his sister so she can get the messages to him. A couple of my puppets were made by an, a, another person from England, um, uh, uh, Brian Clark, and he actually made my puppet stage for me, and he made the boxers, and, uh, but he, he's a good carver. Uh, but there, there are other, some of the performers that are out there, they're, they're still, you know, they're good carvers as well. But again, they understand it and they, they can make the puppets. So. And how about the theater set, which is what I would call it, but I've learned that it's called a fit up? Fit up, that's <laughs> correct, yes. And there's various um, different types. Uh, they have some that are very portable where it's like you just set it up and whoop, you just, it's, it'll set up in a matter of minutes. It's probably, I think they're made of, of a very lightweight aluminum and they could just set it up right away, you know. Now, I will say one thing that has happened. Years ago, most of the Punch and Judy performers worked standing up and the puppets were worked, they would have their hands up in the air. So imagine you're standing all the way up and you're the opening there where the puppets are being seen. I mean, you're working like this the entire show. And I thought to myself, there's no way I can do that. But more and more, that's being dropped. And most of the guys now are doing like I do, and that's where you work with the puppets in front of your face. So I stand up, and they're right at this level, and I can see through the curtain. So you can see if a puppet's drooping. You know, you try, you try to keep some movement going. But uh, more and more, that, that's what they're doing today. And, uh, and you can get, you know, the puppet stage is as elaborate as you want. This was probably one of the deluxe made. And it was made by Brian Clark. And I went over there, and I didn't know it, but Brian was testing me. I had the money. I, I, have, I have to give him credit. He said, I found out later, even though I had the money, he wasn't going to make this for me unless I used a swazzle. Because to him, that's the only true Punch and Judy man uses a swazzle for punch. And he, he told Jeff, and I found out later, he said, I'm not going to make it if he, he's going to. So he'd be willing to turn down a couple thousand dollars just on that principle alone. But that just shows you that's how serious he is, and some of the performers over there. You know? You've been bringing up so many names, uh, performers from the past, also those who are still working, or those who carve the, um, the puppets. How do you all know each other? What is the culture? Do you have meetings? Or Well, there's a group out. It's called the uh, Punch and Judy Fellowship. And even that, it took me years to track that down. Of course, that was before the Internet. You know, it's, uh, I had heard about it. Uh, and somebody told me about it, and then I had to write to somebody. They sent me the address. Of course, you go online today, everything's online. I said there are no secrets in the world. But that is, oh, um, they have a publication called the Swazzle. <laughs> but it's for the Punch and Judy Fellowship. And I actually, I tr tracked down, I went after with a vengeance. I, I got every issue of the Swazzle dating back to like the early 70s. And I have a complete file of that. And I, uh, what is it, a complete file. I, I was really into the periodicals. So I got the uh, animations. I, I, I think I have one of the largest punch periodical collection in the world because I've seen some of the other performers. I'm not saying I have the biggest book collection, but as far as the periodicals are concerned, there was another publication, it was called The Magical Digest. It was owned by a guy named Oscar Oswald in England. And, uh, and there are very few sets, and I know that I have a complete set of that. And I actually got a set from my friend John Stiles, too, you know, just as a gift to him, because I'm really good friends with him. But, um, but that's how, the, more or less, it's uh, communicating that way. And then they have their puppet festivals over in England. They have a, a big May Day festival. They used to have one in the fall, but uh, I think I was over there. I can't recall. Was it a May Day festival or 
the fall of the year. But I went over there, and he just hang with all the guys. And I mean, they were very ex 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 accepting. I mean, they kind of think, oh, this guy came from America, you know. And, but there's guys that would travel from Italy and all around and, and uh, so forth. So it's, uh, but I've gotten to know a lot of them. I've been to their houses, too, a couple times, more than once. And, uh, but, you know, you talk shop and stuff. But then after a while, they just become your friends. So you don't, you don't even have to talk about puppets. Hey, what are you doing? You know, blah, 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 so forth. But, you know. So it sounds like uh, Punch and Judy's thriving in the UK. In the UK, yes. How is it doing here in the US? Hey, just OK. <laughs> Part of the reason is, is um, the, the demand isn't there. I also think it's a marketing problem. And I've often had that. Um, I've known that for a long time. Uh, most, if you say Punch and Judy, you, you often hear two things. One, what is that? Or two, oh, that's a violent puppet show. That's usually what you hear. And so it's a very hard to overcome that. I mean, I figured out some ways how to get around it but, and, and market my, myself. But um, you know, so it's a little bit with uh, political correctness as well. I know a performer, Fred Greenspan, real nice guy. He lives in Palm Beach, and I, I, was, I stopped down to see him in January, and we were talking, and he left New York because of, uh, well, it was a variety of reasons, but he just said where he could no longer bring out a slapstick in the show. And all of a sudden, they didn't want to see, uh, um, like, a, a devil in the show, or the crocodile. And it was, it's like, after a while, it was like, give me a break. But like for me, I'd say, I, I won't bend on that. You know, it's, it's, it's going to have those characters. Now, I will say this. I've learned some lessons. I've learned Punch and Judy is best not performed at uh, daycare centers and children's museums. Because what happens is you run into helicopter parents and teachers, educators. And it's like, oh, no, Joe, Joey can't fall down. Oh, no, 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 don't fall down. You know, and it's just that where somebody does fall down, they learn, hey, maybe I'm, I won't run next time, you know, that type of thing. But it's, um, by staying away from those two venues, I've had no complaints, none, at festival. All right, I did have, all right, let me just say this, once in a blue, blue moon, once every five or six years, once I was at, doing a, a performing a Christmas show, and the children were laughing their heads off, and this lady came up to me in the back, and she's pulling on my leg. Now, I'm doing a show, and I got a microphone on. And she goes, Mr. Horn, Mr. Horn. And it was, you know, so you got these puppets up in action. Yeah, yeah, you're scaring the kids. And I'm like, what? What are you, what are you talking about? They're, they're out there laughing their heads off. So uh, at the end of the show, the, uh, what was it, the guy who hired me, I was talking with him, and he said, uh, what did they say to you? And I said, well, they said I was scaring the kids. And I said, he said, scaring the kids? He goes, what is she talking about? And I, I, and I mentioned something to her about the Three Stooges. And she said, oh, I hate the Three Stooges. And I said that to him. And he goes, what? She doesn't like the Three Stooges. She says, I'm never going to let that lady in here again. So I mean, it was a kind of crazy stuff. But I have to say, I, that rarely, rarely ever happens. I, I hear no complaints at birthday parties. None. None. Uh, I perform in, in Fells Point on a street. Of course, I'd never hear anything there. Uh, festivals, I never hear any complaints. And I've performed in a lot of, you know, some uh, museums, upscale museums, art museums, and so forth. And uh, I don't get any complaints about it, but it's, I think when you, again, when there's very young children and, you know, parents that hover over their children and so forth, and educators like that, I think sometimes you run into issues. So I just try to avoid those issues, that's all. So, you know. I know it's a Baltimore-based tradition, uh, this mm -hmm. particular horn show, um, but is there a connection to Fells Point, the neighborhood on the harbor in the city? Well, like I said, there was a show there. It was actually, and I've only found this out like about a year ago, in the fact that there was a punch show down there in the 1700s. So when I first started out, I thought, uh, because I liked that area, I thought, you know, I'm going to go down here. It's 
going to have our Christmas time. And I don't know what possessed me to do this, because I wasn't connected with anybody, but I went and set up on a street corner. They had a parade of lighted boats, and I set up and did, did my show. It got a big reaction. So then I became known down there and uh, people, and then they, I got um, booked for the Fells Point Fun Festival. So this went on and on and on. And then, um, and then probably about five years ago, I thought I'm either going to take the show up a few notches or I'm going to maybe stop performing down there altogether. So I sent the letter out to a lot of people, um, what was it, uh, business leaders, uh, people that own properties and so forth, and said, look, this is the dream. I want to come down here and perform my show. And uh, the whole idea is to have something for the children and uh, so forth. And, you know, I'm willing to be, um, you know, as far as put a, a banner up saying my show is sponsored by you. So I sent it out to all these individuals. But, and there was this one gentleman, his name is Dominic Eckenstein. He's from Switzerland. And he had a, there was a hotel that um, Admiral fell in. And what happened was is I, uh, um, he asked me to do some shows. And he, then he said he was going to pay me. And I said, no, nah, forget about it. I th and again, I thought he just worked there. I had no idea he owned a hotel, and he was very wealthy. So years later, when I sent these letters out, I sent one to him, and then Dominic called me up and said that uh, he would like to sponsor my show. So that's what happened. He sent me to England for two weeks, and I was able to get the show of my dreams built. And I perform now in Fells Point uh, about two or three times a month. And, and I perform for free. and. Um, and I actually have things that I, I have a ba banner that says sponsored by Dominic Eckestein, the Admiral fell in, and I give out these little finger puppets that has his name on it and the hotel's name. So it's a very good will gesture. And actually, they give me free valet parking, which is great. Well, what's a lot to like? I pull up, they, they take my car, they park it, and they deliver it right to me at the end. I mean, this is like a, you know, it's like, what, what a great gig this is, you know. So I, I'm there for... I think I just completed my first year. I got about another five to go. So, but but I like doing it, and they like it. So it's you know, that's my connection with Fells Point. You know. One of my favorite questions to ask uh, masters in any tradition really is why do they do it? Why do you? I mean, from just from listening to you all day today, it's obvious you have a lot of passion for uh, not only magic, but obviously Punch and Judy shows as yeah. well, and the yeah. puppetry and all the knowledge and skills and history. Behind it, what is it? I think the key thing for me is that and you look around and see something that was around and then it no longer exists. Uh, I walk around some shopping districts that when I was a child and it looked like a bomb went off. I mean, these stores no longer exist. Uh, a lot of things that I, uh, certain stores, people, whatever, char char neighborhood characters, they're gone. And, um, but when I saw this show, I just thought to myself, I, if, if I walk away from that, that show's gone forever. And, you know, I can't save the world, but I could save one thing. And that's, I think, what caused it. The other thing, too, is, is that, um, what was it, somewhere, um, it was in the early 80s, that movie came out, Home Alone. And I remember you couldn't get tickets to, to get into the movie theater. I had two nieces, and I took them in there. And unless you were there, you wouldn't understand it. I heard children laugh like I'd never heard them laugh before. And the reason for it, it was slapstick comedy. And I didn't know about Punch and Judy at that point, see? So when I, I always said, that's the kind of laughs I really want to get in my show. It's, it's one thing to get a couple laughs, but I really, I thought that, that true laughter to hear little kids, just spontaneous laughter, that's what I was aiming for. And then when I saw George Horn's show that years later, and I heard that, I said, that's it, that's it. So it was a combination of those two things, you know. Plus, I'm kind of like a nostalgic guy. I am, you know, I'll admit that, you know. You know, it's that's surprising. 
<laughs> so, who's apprenticing to you? How is it going to be carried on? I don't necessarily know. Now, two things have happened. One is, um, years ago, I was approached by Maryland Traditions. And my son, this is, a, I, to me, this is an interesting story. So, uh, somewhere, well, he was born in 95. My son has actually seen my show. Well, my son's, uh, he'll be 23. But bef I would say my son has seen the show several thousand times. Because he would go to me to every show he could, except birthday parties. Wait, thousands? Several thousand. Wow. Times, yeah. <laughs> and I actually have it on video uh, somewhere. But when he was about five or six, I brought the show back and I just put, I put it there without the top on. And he stood up on a chair and did my whole show, you know, for 15 minutes from start to end. And he was saying some stuff. I had a joke there about Viagra. He had no idea what I was talking about. But I mean, it was a, a joke and he, he did that. And every once in a while he would say, Dad, what's next? And I would give him the line, and then he would, bah, 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 and he would do that. And my wife and myself, we were just besides ourselves that, he, that he, he knew the show. So when Marilyn Traditions approached me, I just said, uh, you know, my son, I, I, you know, I'd be willing to teach the show to him. So that's what happened. And uh, we, we, we got this award, and actually that's how I went to England. I took him and my wife, and we went to England, and we went to a Punch and Judy festival. But he could do the show for a while. But his interest has kind of swayed a little bit. I mean, he's a chef now, and, but he does do stand-up comedy. So I think I rubbed off to him in some respects, you know. I mean, I would like for him to do it, but I don't think he should force anybody. It's got to come from within. But I have actually, I have, um, I'm not releasing it anytime soon, but I've, I've written a, uh, something. Uh, about Punch and Judy, uh, the American Punch and Judy show, where I've taken, I've recorded all of it, as far as like what what you should do, you know, if you're working, you know, in this situation and so forth. So one day that'll go to somebody. Maybe I'll teach a course in Punch and Judy. I don't know, but that's further down the road, you know. But I've taken those steps to do that. So it's uh, hopefully all is not lost, you know. So I would hate to. I wish somebody would have given me this, and that would have been what I started with. But a lot of it I had to learn on the fly. Yeah. So, uh, I guess I'm dying to ask, how racy can your show get? <laughs> <laughs> well, they have <laughs> racy. <laughs> I mean, you could do with it. With I mean, I have some jokes. I, I actually hold back some jokes. Uh, I'm not going to say I'm here. I mean, I don't think they're necessarily bad. I mean, I, I mean, there are some that I've used. Um, and again, I don't. They're they're suggestive, uh, innuendos, I would say. And uh, but I've had a couple of people may have just I mean, spit their water out. I mean, when they were here in the lines. But uh, yeah, I try to be a little bit careful. They have these things called. I don't go to them, but they're called puppet slams, and. Um, and they're actually meant for an all-adult audience where you will come and put on a puppet show for adults and you could use adult material. And I've been asked to do that, but I've just, I don't know, I just, I'm not really, a, I like Punch and Judy. And let me just say this, I love the Muppets, but I would never want to do that type of show. I like marionettes, I would never want to do that show. It's just something about Punch and Judy that just got to me. And uh, I have no desire to do any other kind of puppet show but Punch and Judy. Uh, I'll admit it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's it for me, you know, so. Just for later, when we uh, get some good footage of all your items, I'd just like to ask you about your collection, sure, how you've sure. amassed it and what. Sure. What has driven it and what maybe some items you have in it that you could talk about now and that we'll look at in a, in a little sure. bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, some of the things, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the items, well, thank, thank goodness for eBay, you know, that's where I found some things. Other things, I, um, this one item over there, it's a French print. 
I, it was the goofiest story. I was with my son in Harford County, Maryland. We went to an antique mall, a mall with antiques. And I said to him, wouldn't it be funny if I found something with Punch and Judy? And the next thing I know, I found this print. Then it had some kind of stain on it. So I went to a professional restorer called Garrow. And all the magicians use Garrow. And I said, I want to put it on linen, but I want you to clean it up. And when they did, all the color came off of it. I almost died. I thought, I mean, that's, I didn't want the color to come. I just wanted you to clean it up. So it took me eight years to find this. And I, I just determined to get this, and I went after it with a vengeance. And I was at a magic collector's meeting. And I, I knew it was from France. And I was at this meeting, and there's this guy from France. And I said, I started, he had broken English, and I talked with him, and he had it. But he didn't want to sell it. So we went back and forth, back and forth, and finally, I think in January or something, he said he, he'd be willing to sell it. My wife's not here, is she? Okay. I <laughs> but it was a lot of money. <laughs> I, I was determined to get it, and he sold it to me, so I got it back again. But I <laughs> just don't tell my wife. But anyway, that's the story with that one, yeah. So I found that one. Other ones I found, you know, it's, it's, it's here and there. It's a hit and miss, you know, the... Uh, well, one of the things, a Victorian scene, I actually bought that while I was in London during my honeymoon. Uh, Cecil Court, I think there was a place there. Uh, called Pleasures and Pastimes or, or some, something like that. But I bought that one there. And other ones I picked up on eBay. Uh, was a guy named Jonathan Reynolds who uh, had a place called Dramatis Persona. And he dealt in rare um, uh, books all dealt with the theater and so forth. I don't know if Jonathan's still around, but that one there from Portugal from 1828 with the Queen, Queen of Portugal, I got that from him. I think I already paid 300 for it, but I, I bet that thing's worth about $1,000 today. I've never seen another one. I've showed it to friends over in England and said, wow, what a nice piece, you know. But, uh, you know, it's like, again, you pick them up here, you pick them up there, and, uh, and they're on all my walls in my house. I have them all displayed. And, uh, so you kind of have like a, a bit of a museum at home? I mean, it's sort of like that. Yeah, but there's certain rooms my wife won't let me go into. Um, she kicked me out of the powder room. I'm no longer in that one. Uh, I mean, when you come into the house, it's all there, you know, but it's, uh, and she won't let me go. In. I said, uh, nothing in the kitchen, nothing in the powder room, and then there's like a, a family room there. There's nothing in there. But I have the parlor and the dining room and so forth, you know. Plus, I actually have a lot of stuff. I just don't have it displayed because it's, um, and I have some filing cabinets. You know, I got a lot of Punch of Judy in there, too. So a lot of it's just packed away, you know, but it's, uh, anyway. Why are you collecting now? This is my last question, just in uh, general. What's the need? I don't think there's a need. I mean, um. You know, I've written a lot of articles about Punch and Judy, and um, I've written, you know, in the Swazzle publication. Well, I, I wrote that whole story about uh, George Prentice. That was such a huge hit with them. You can, you will find nothing written about that man, nothing. But I found his uh, was a great nephew or somebody, a relative. And that's how I was able to trace this. And that was, they still talk about this story because he was considered to be a god over in uh, probably one of the best Punch and Judy men in America. And, uh, but they still talk about him today over in England. So it's like finding this stuff and writing these stories. And uh, um, you know, it's like putting puzzles together. You know, you get a little bit of information, you do a little research. There was another guy, uh, his name's Dagmar. And uh, there is a film clip, it was an opera, uh, Naughty Marietta, I think it's the name of it, but there's a little scene in there of him doing a Punch and Judy show, but it's probably only about two minutes long. But I've been doing some research on him, so I'll probably write an article in the Swazzle about him. 
So, I mean, some of it's just the right articles or stuff. So, I mean, it's just collecting it and, and preserving it, saving it, you know. But, uh, you know, today, I don't know if I would do it all over again. But I have no regrets, none whatsoever, you know. So, uh, I've been cataloging it and so forth. So, my wife knows what all the stuff is, you know. So, it's... So she doesn't say, oh, look, you have a bunch of letters. Throw them out. I was like, God, you know what's in there? You know, it's, it's all these letters written by this guy. I mean, I, have, I had letters. I had actually had a, um, it wasn't Punch and Judy, but uh, I got a postcard from John Waters. He's talking about one of my books and saying how much he liked it. And a couple of letters from Teller, of Penn and Teller, how much of a fan he was of one of my books and so forth. So I wanted to keep all that together so my wife doesn't say, oh, look at this, old, old correspondence, let's just throw it out, you know. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know. Is there anything you feel I should have asked you or you would like to add? You have time? You guys got time or what? We're running out of time. Can we uh, just ask a quick question? Sure. As a lay person, yeah. have you speak to correctly what I ask? Can you just describe what a swazzle is? Yes. So, a swazzle, it's about the size of a postage stamp. But just imagine two of them, okay? And they're made of metal. Um, they used to be made out of uh, aluminum until they found out you're not supposed to use that. So the good ones are actually made out of silver. So I actually had mine made over in England from a, a silversmith. And they're curved. And uh, what happens is, is you use this, uh, uh, it has to be cotton. It's a cotton twill tape. And you, you run it through there around this other piece. You wrap it around. And then you tie uh, a piece of thread around it. And then you dip it in water and then put it in your mouth. And it, as you blow through it, it, it makes this sound. It's like a reed, like a reed instrument. And then you speak, and you speak through that, and that's what gives you Mr. Punch's voice, you know. But they're, they'll drive you crazy, those swazzles, because sometimes it's, you'll have to make them three, four, five, six times. You try it, it doesn't, you know, they, they say the good ones is that when you blow, you, where you can get the, or the right tone from the front and the back. And if you can get that, that's, that's a good sound. But, uh, and then the other thing is you have to, usually when you're making it, you're actually dipping that t twill tape. Like, uh, it's a, uh, it like a herringbone cotton twill tape or something. But you have to dip it in hot water. So you, and, and, that's, and then after it shrinks a little bit, that's when you use it and make your swazzle. But that's what gives, gives you Mr. Punch's voice. You know. And how long do they last? A good while. Yeah, a good while. You know. Actually, should be... You know, I should actually have spares with me. They all, you know, they say that you should have two or three spares. I, I don't, and I feel ashamed because uh, I haven't swallowed one yet. A lot of people have, and um, uh, they actually say you're not a good punch and judy performer to you swallow one. Do you swallow one? But I'm kind of glad. That I, I hope I go throughout my life without swallowing one of those. You know, um, we won't get into what you have to do afterwards, but <laughs> but. Um, yeah, yeah, anyway, so that's, that's about it with that. I have some stories if you want to hear I want to hear stories, right. yes. All right, okay. Uh, some stories. I had a call once to, uh, to do a Punch of Judy show for a, uh, this guy called me up and said, hey, we, I want you to do it. It's a birthday party. I said, okay. And I said, uh, he says, my, my son, though, has a handicap. He didn't say what it was, and I didn't ask him. And I went to his house, and he was very, they were very wealthy. He was a doctor. And his son, I guess it's okay to say it here, right? His son had no ears. That was, that was his thing. But his father made for him some kind of device that went over his head, like a headset, so his son could hear. And during the show, his son was acting up. And... Uh, Afterwards, the father said, I have never seen my son get so excited about a show in all my life, you know. 
And it kind of touched me when he did that, you know. And uh, that, that was one experience that I had. The, uh, another time, I got, some guy said, uh, I have this event. We're celebrating our 100th anniversary. I'd like for you to come out to perform. And I said, yeah, sure. I said, well, what kind of event is it? He goes, well, we're, we're a funeral parlor, and we're celebrating our 100th anniversary. So I said, okay, okay. So it was in the fall of the year, and I was coming to the event, and I said, oh, where am I going to perform? He goes, oh, outside. I said, okay. So uh, I was coming to the event, and it was pouring down raining. And I'm thinking, oh, it's going to cancel for sure. So I get there, and I said, well, I guess you're going to cancel. I goes, no, 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 we're, we're going to move it indoors. So I went in, and I swear I was performing it in one of the viewing rooms, my Punch and Judy show. And for the longest time, I, I, I didn't want to ask the guy, like, you know, where's all the bodies, you know. But because, I found out later, because it was their 100th anniversary, they had closed the shop down for a week so they could repaint and put, uh, you know, new... Um, carpet in and so forth, but I always thought that was a good one. <laughs> I had uh, one booking that I did for many years. I did it for about five or six years. I was actually hired by a group of lawyers, and I won't tell you the name of the program, but I would perform for very, very good money, three shows a year, and then what would happen is the people... Uh, the children would come in and watch my show, and then they would leave the room, and they would be interviewed. And the whole purpose was they were being, uh, they were talking to lawyers, people studying law, and it was to test their memories, to see how much that they could remember. And it was basically to check, I guess, for if they were you know, like child abuse or something. Like, how good was their memory? And the people interviewing me had not seen the show. So they were asking them, and then they're saying, oh, this, this crocodile came in. <laughs> it was this monkey. But that, that was the whole idea. They were, they were talking about the magic show, but the Punch of Judy as well. But I, mean, I thought that, that was a pretty good one. And another time, a couple years back, it was uh, uh, Captain, what was it, Captain John Smith? Was that it? But they had a big celebration. What was it 300 years, 350 years? And while I was there, they, uh, they put me at this spot and said, this is where I want you to perform. And what happened was I was next to a gallows, and they would bring a guy up and hang this person. Of course, he had a brace on and everything, but they would bring him up on the thing, put him up there, pull the thing, and the guy would just drop and hang. And then they would say, and now we're going to have our children's entertainment. So I followed that. And I just thought that that I was like, how bizarre is that? You know, it's like, how, how do you follow that? You know, but that was just another one of those crazy things, you know. But I've had all kind of like crazy things like that happen. And they're the fun things, too. And I actually think that's another reason why I like to perform. I get to meet people like, like you guys. And it's uh, go places I would never go otherwise. And... Uh, Anyway, it's, that's part of the fun business of it, you know, so. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. That thank was you. absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you. <laughs> so. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.